Oh, and my friend, how are you? Good, good, how are you? I'm all right, where do I find you? Yeah, I am, um, uh, I've just finished the day's recording, so uh, this is where I am, in my home studio, where uh, basically all the magic happens. <laughs> if I go back to the time where we started doing the, uh, the songs together, the thing that stays in my mind is that you, in the piano, and out of nowhere, saying, we've got the lyrics, how about this? And a song was created out of nothing, just your fingers moving around and trying to understand uh, what the lyrics were about, which was an, an easy job. Uh, you still get the same buzz when, when, when music comes out from your fingers and from your mind? Yeah, the, the, way that, the way that we started working on the production together, or the way that I started working on it, um, was very minimal. It was literally sitting on a piano um, with my phone recording the audio and I would have some ideas, I would have some inspiration based on the lyrics that you'd sent me and I just pressed record on the phone and played a couple of bars, sang maybe what a verse would sound like and then I just sent it. I was able to text it to you, it was so simple. The thing about your, your music is that uh, you are a hundred different people at the same time. That has been converted into at least two or three projects. So why don't we go through all of them? How is Best Boy Grip? Is he all right? Best Boy Grip's great. Um, <laughs> I actually performed as Best Boy Grip just last week. Um, I should explain Best Boy Grip is basically the initial project that I began with maybe five years ago. Um, it started very much as a piano based, you know, piano vocal um, song songs, you know, and then it kind of developed uh, into a band and then the band kind of disbanded slightly just because people have a lot of have their own lives and it was kind of hard to keep those things going together. And it then became an, back into a solo project again and turned electronic, uh, quite unusual. Um, basically, its goal was to be played as well as the great people locally who play stuff. Uh, it's always aimed at six music. So any of your subscribers, if they if they listen to BBC Six Music, um, maybe they've already heard some stuff because um, a lot of stuff's played by, you know, Steve Lamack, uh, Gideon Co, Lauren Laverne. You know, there's Tom Robinson has been a fantastic supporter right from the start. Um, so anything I make, that's kind of my end goal. That's that's the audience I'm looking for, and it's certainly not for everybody. But music is subjective and. The sooner you recognize that, the happier life will be. <laughs> Never should have left you alone. Without leaving Best Boy Grip, uh, is it uh, Monster and Me, the song that has been played more often in, in BBC Six? Um, Monster and Me was picked up by Tom Robinson, um, and that that's piano and vocal. I mean, it's as it's as raw and basic as it gets. Um, and I think I think whatever about the lyrics and that, it really it's caught Tom's attention, and he had us over doing a live session in London and Six Music, and has supported me with everything I've done since um, and then maybe a track like Sharks came out it was very it's much more rocky grungy kind of heavy guitar and Steve Lamack picked up on that you know it was a different DJ and then another track maybe Reptile was released and that was much more kind of 80s pop disco inspired and Lauren Laverne on Six Music picked up on that too so there were three very different genres even within the one project which got the attention of three very different DJs. Um, and that's kind of where I've, it's, you know, some people could say it's a, a hindrance <laughs> because you can't really tie yourself into one box. Uh, but that's just the way it is. It's, I make whatever comes out that day and I then try to, I have the problem of what do I do with it once it's been created. Um, I don't worry about that at the start. I just make whatever comes out. and. It was between um, Monster and Me and Sharks that uh, that we worked together, and as I told you many times, it's one of the creative wise is one of the most exciting things I've ever done. Uh, I'm not sure where it came out, and I'm not sure what people think of it, but certainly it's something that I had a lot of fun with. You, I sent a, 
a tweet saying, you know, I wrote some lyrics. Now I realize those lyrics were not music lyrics at all, thanks to your uh, very um, nice kind of criticism <laughs> of it and, uh, and what you did with it, which is basically destroy it completely uh, and bring a word here, a word there, put a sentence together. But that was part of the process of uh, the learning process of it. Uh, so yes, I put that tweet out, you responded, and, uh, and out of which uh, we've exchanged emails, messages, WhatsApps, and the song, songs came about, and uh, you play the songs, we play them together a couple of times. From those times that we play them, just uh, bring back one or two, one or two memories of, uh, of those nights. It's not hard to get people into a room, for one, if you, if you mention that you're coming to town. Um, <laughs> you, you seem to draw a crowd uh, everywhere, all over the world. So when I mentioned that we were going to put together a, a gig um, that was going to be part music and part a chat with Guillaume Balaguer, just the, the way you do your thing, uh, the Q&A, um, I found that fascinating, by the way. Every single person in that room in, in the two gigs that we did together, it was just hanging on every word you're saying. And, and they get some insight into some stories that they may not read in the papers, you know, and, you know, I don't know, just hear more about the characters of certain footballers and managers. And I would suggest if anyone hasn't gone and thought about going to one of these, I would say go. But it's, it's, uh, it always brings the house down. Um, um, and then, of course, I had the terrifying task of trying to play some music at one of these gigs, um, which, well, two of them. We did one in Liverpool, um, home of the Beatles, in the cavern, actually. In the uh, cavern. The... Unforgettable night. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this strange extravaganza. Uh, it's going to be a bit of football and it's going to be music as well. And it couldn't be anywhere else but Liverpool, of course, and the cavern. We're recording this because we're never ever going to be on this stage ever again, but it's a good opportunity to make a little bit of uh, personal history. Best by grip! Mendieta was DJing, isn't that right? That's right, that's <laughs> which, right. Which is, he was at the is, cavern. Uh, we had King and Skulls, which is another folk band in, from Liverpool that uh, uh, they right. did a completely different process with the with the lyrics and sang them. They actually sang them all, all of them. So they're very long songs <laughs> with a lot of lyrics in it. Uh, and then uh, it was it was you, and then as you said, there was a little bit of a chat with uh, Gaithka Mendieta, and uh, then Mendieta DJ at the end. Interestingly enough. Um, they stayed until you finish, uh, but they didn't. Most of the people didn't stay for Mendieta to DJ, and it was the, f the fun part of it. try to explain what's behind or how we work in one of the songs uh, let's say because of you for instance uh, that was one again where uh, there was a long list of words that were sent to you uh, you cut it down you chose words uh, you chose not, not so much words but perhaps sentences of it and then uh, you tried to leave for me there had to be a narrative in the story but for you it doesn't have to be the gaps are part also of writing a song so even if it doesn't seem to have um, a chronology behind it or, or an order that kind of mystery also helps the song so you got rid of a lot of stuff left some of it uh, that's what I remember of it what was the musical part of it because you normally obviously write your own lyrics and your own music you got lyrics was it the first time that you worked that way and how did that go well lyrically would what I think you're referring to in my mind, I wasn't necessarily taking away um, chronology or, you know, I, I didn't feel like I was trying to take away elements of a story. What I was trying to express to you was the, with songs, it's not necessarily, with lyrics, it's not necessarily like listing facts. It's not necessarily, so we'll go to this 
room, we'll open this door, then we'll go and see what's inside this door, then we'll talk to the person that's on the inside of that door. It's kind of, you're kind of trying to set things up. Um, you know, not, not not always just metaphorically, but something where you can leave a bit of imagination for the for the listener, so that it appeals to them as well as you and hopefully their friend and somebody else. And you're you're trying to leave space for people to imagine what it is that you're actually trying to say. And that's kind of you know you're saying that I, I completely ripped them apart. I I felt I I what you gave me was excellent and it was great to work with and i think once i kind of once we had that discussion um because songwriting is very different from being an author and you're an incredible author and you sit you sell a ton of books and people love them and you get great reviews for them but it's very different it's a different form of writing and i think that was part of the thing that we enjoyed most was kind of just sharing me trying to get that across without being um without being disrespectful in any way to, to anything to anything that you gave um it was basically just trying to get get you to understand that and you you got it you got it right from the start and the next things you would send through were like night and day it was like you you totally got what i was trying to say and the lyrics benefited um all from that styles in your head transformed into songs that has meant that after the best boy grip project you started another one with elma orchestra so how, how is that going elma orchestra is going very well it's it's kind of taken over um recently it's you know it's it was elma orchestra was a plan it kind of was supposed to be like a portfolio of sorts which then ended up, it just it was something that I had to do. I just had to create this music. There are no lyrics in it. I don't sing. Um, I kind of went on, I went through this period of, I'm kind of still in it of, for about six to ten months where I was just getting really irritated by the, so the sound of my own voice. And I mean, it's, people may, I don't know, people may say, well, <laughs> I'm not surprised. Others will were actually quite surprised and, and were kind of, how can that happen? And I started hearing it as almost like as a production tool and it didn't match what I wanted the production sound to be. And it's it's the weirdest thing because it's such a personal thing because it's your own voice. And that kind of led to Elm Orchestra because I just decided I'm not singing anymore. Orchestra has led to other work, BBC documentaries, and um, I've also discovered DJs on even on BBC Six Music and other ones like uh, like Stephen McCauley um, on BBC as well as BBC Soundscapes, who will play this material. It's stuff that you wouldn't imagine that you would sit down and listen to. It's not I wouldn't call it radio friendly. It's far from it. But when you start making this stuff, you realize that there's an audience there for a lot of types of music and. There's a huge audience for the kind of stuff that I'm doing with Elma Orchestra, and I was surprised. Um, it's basically getting the same kind of airplay that Best Boy Group was getting, just with different DJs, which is incredible. recommend everybody to, uh, to have a look to listen 
with a with an open mind because as you said uh, some of it is uh, radio friendly call it like that some of it isn't and that's the fascinating thing about it because uh, as we've been uh, friends and, and talking about music I have known that uh, to get into the industry is harder much harder than than people think and there's of course a way of getting into the music uh, industry which is you know x factor way if you like uh, and then there is the way that you do in it and you are fighting uh, against the tide a lot of the time and you're trying to um, still enjoy what you do and be creative in the way you do things but of course be commercially uh, viable too because you want to live on this the best way for you to learn this industry is to try and do almost as well as much as you possibly can by yourself so all all the production is done by me, all the songwriting is done by me, um, all the music videos are done by me, all the, the promotion is done by me, the marketing, the PR, the radio pushing, uh, the looking for gigs and things, it's all. It's always just been done by me and some may say that that has hindered progression in some ways, um, it possibly it has, you know, if you hand over to, to someone whose job is only to get you gigs every single day, you'll absolutely be playing 30 days a month, you know. Um, whereas if you try to do it yourself, you have to, it's, it feels like an admin day. You know, it feels like I have to go and be bothered to email these people when all I want to do is make music. So certainly, I think it could have held me back in some ways, but it's made me understand the industry much more. And I mean, you briefly touched on the likes of X Factor and that. It's absolutely all about entertainment and TV. With that, it's very, very, very little to do with the music. No matter what people think, they may hear a vocal on it and they may think, oh, that's fantastic, I love that person. And some will go on and have some careers, but the vast majority of them will go back to doing the pub gigs and trying to shake the fact that they were on X Factor from their shoulders and from their everything, their every being. It can become a complete hindrance to a lot of people. Um, I'm glad you're taking the, the hard route. Uh, it's, it is, at the end, the most pleasing one, of course. Uh, even though you have to, you, you cannot do everything though. <laughs> uh, you, as as you say, you're gonna allow others to uh, take some of that work off. But I do love the videos that you do, uh, linked to the uh, to the songs. Uh, and in fact, I'm gonna ask you for a little favor. Uh, in this YouTube channel that we're trying to uh, grow, this music it has to be music at the, at the beginning of uh, videos, at the end as well, maybe in the middle. Can I use some of your music? Absolutely, of course. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, the last time we were talking, we brief. The last time we spoke on the phone, we briefly, you briefly mentioned this, um, and my answer still stands. Of course, um, I love I love your channel uh, since it started up. Primarily, I was watching it during the World Cup. Um, it was just fascinating. Uh, me and Dara, my son, we just sat and watched and having the insight of somebody who just so knowledgeable um, and. It, the real football football friends of mine have always said that they're just huge fans of yours. Um, I openly told you the first time we met that I'm not necessarily a football guy. Um, since, since my fun or sorry, since my son was born, I've gone back to watching a lot more. Um, he's a big Barca fan, and he plays with a team here called Tristar, and he loves it, and he's very talented, and it's got me into watching more. But it's now made me understand why. He, you're so good at your analysis and, and whatever else. So absolutely anything that can help this channel, I will that give be, to you. That'd be brilliant. <laughs> I'll, I'll, take, I'll take that for, for certain. Thank you very much for, for your words. In about, I'd say, six months time, if not earlier, you're going to say like, these are the guys that we saw in the cavern. The super talented, super intelligent and charming best boy grip. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Loving here was never easy And loving here was never easy